Hello and welcome to my presentation about security. I decided to go for this really cryptic and weird title of the presentation. I, I think I would pronounce it CVE MITRE CVSS NVD CNA OSS WTF or, or something like that. I also went to, for the subtitle uh, Keeping the World from Burning or actually I suggested different alternative titles to the conference where I did this talk but they were um, brave enough to use this title in the conference which I kind of appreciated. So the conference last week that I did this presentation at was this Nordic Software Security Summit uh, on this site and this what I'm doing now is a retake or I'm doing it again because it wasn't recorded and now I am recording it for, for you to get a chance to view. I just want to help them out and say that they are running the conference again next year around this time of year it was a good conference i enjoyed it so i am daniel stenberg i work for wolf ssl i do curl development full time every day all day that's my site that's uh, the photo of my workplace that i'm recording this at although from your what you're watching behind is a different angle anyway i'm going to talk to you today about well open source security and how it could be for someone who maintains an open source project like curl like i do or we do because i'm certainly not alone but uh, i think sometimes when i talk to people who work with uh, security and cves and all of these things they they seem to not have a complete knowledge a complete picture of what it actually is and how it works so i'm here to tell you about it a little bit and i of course i'm the as i already mentioned i am the lead developer founder main, uh, a maintainer of curl, curl the open source project we do internet transfers curl of course started the i mean the original uh, first efforts uh, trace back to this 106 line toy I started working with in 1996 that has developed into these more than 170,000 lines I would call the inf internet infrastructure project today and I am the only full-time employee working on this and but there are thousands of contributors and over a thousand of commit authors so quite a lot of people involved we estimate that we have curl now in more than 20 billion installations worldwide it's a staggering amount of installations it is of course completely fully open source and um, available for everyone it is installed in well virtually everything anything that is internet connected uh, that uh, as you can see on this image then uh, i have a bunch of examples like cars tvs vehicles other vehicles uh, computer games mobile phones tablets printers medical devices a lot of games a lot of apps uh, speakers game uh, hardware of different kinds uh, all sorts of servers it's been used on march uh, mars it's the, it's the word uh, the planet and um, so yes it's being shipped as a component in windows on mac on in uh, all linux distributions so you can find curl in many places probably one uh, or for sure one of the most widely used software components in the world i wouldn't say that it is the most used but uh, mostly because it's impossible to know and there are some competing opinions and uh, thoughts about it but it's certainly one of the top ones so i know a thing or two about uh, using doing working with open source used in a lot of places and open source of course today every developer who develops you know software knows about open source and every developer today uses open source because open source is now today certainly a foundation of everything that we do every every software project and by then by extension every digital project uh, product service has open source somewhere and a lot of developers participate in open source and uh, uh, yeah it uses open source everywhere uh, so um, 
it while it is a, certainly a infrastructure underpinning of everything uh, we also know that open source remain underfunded to a large extent and a lot of projects are struggling with getting things done and progressed in the way they want to i would say that based on all that i mean we have open source everywhere somewhere around de depending on who you're asking and I, I guess how you're measuring open source is in something like 75 to 95 percent of everything so it's a large chunk of all software and yet we don't have that many critical open source issues that have you know really been at the the sky is falling level dangerous but we have had a bunch of them right the heart bleed log for shell left pad and the xz backdoor uh, from it's not last year uh, it's this uh, it doesn't matter uh, okay so there, there are a bunch of really you know big news issues that have occurred but there are also not that many more right there has to be i mean considering the volume and the amount of things that are using open source it's not that bad so open source issues are ten, ten, they tend to be found really quickly and they are addressed quickly all of these that i mentioned they were addressed fairly uh, yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't say very quickly but uh, most of them were found and fixed extremely quickly and they're all managed in public and you know the with the greatest possible transparency and uh, information possible exactly the way you want open source to work and how it actually works so i think it proves that open source works <clears throat> the biggest problems that these issues and other issues like this have caused i mean the biggest problems involving all of these that i mentioned these four particular issues at least and, and most others the, the biggest problems then end up in other areas P most in users of these projects and in most cases actually not open source users of these projects but in commercial proprietary other uh, well different users that are slow or maybe not open enough on how they use these products so i would say that considering how how big of an impact open source has how large volume it is I don't think open source creates very many critical issues in, in software development. But of course, it's not a question of many. They still happen, of course. And then we have this notion about an open source supply chain, right? It's a very popular term and, and uh, expression to use these days, but without a relationship. So do am I really your supplier? And in this in at this conference that i did this presentation last week there was a lot of talk about the cra and how getting you know requirements on, on components in in digital infrastructure things and in digital products but if i'm not a if if you don't have a relationship do, who am i to provide you with something solid maybe i'm just a hobby right so i think it's time for users of open source to also make up their minds about their dependencies and decide if it's just if it's just a hobby or if it's a supplier you're leaning on so yeah i i like this sarcastic i i, I use this quote sarcastically of course but this particular quote was someone who commented on my blog a while ago and i find it <clears throat> amusing um anyway so about vulnerabilities we all have vulnerabilities every now and then every project that is developed um, and used widely get their fair share of security vulnerabilities and i guess pretty much everything does that has a certain amount of attention and, and research poked or you know investigated or, or um, researched so everyone has them and they are mostly identified by their CVE identifiers as you might know of course you know every, yeah, as, as well as everyone knows about the open source everyone has an idea or know about CVE CVE is a, a fun thing because uh, 
I'm, I've been told that it's not they don't want it to be uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures anymore. It's just CV. I haven't really found that, but it doesn't really matter. This is how it, the, the name, the abbreviation was created. So it, and it's just a well, it's also uh, managed by, by this organization with this crazy name that I, I understand and I know that people don't really know how to pronounce. I don't know either, but I call it MITRE because I've heard re representatives of the, that organization say so. Maybe it is MITRE, maybe it's something else. And uh, a CVE identifier is a bug identifier, really. It's just a number that you can request. And getting a CVE number is just... You, anyone can request a CVE ID for any product, really. But it's not entirely true. But basically, you just go to uh, and one of these organizations and say, hey, I have a problem with this and I need a CVE. And you get a CVE ID. Without, you don't have to provide any evidence. You don't have to do much at all. Pretty much, you just have to ask for a CVE ID. And they are given out on request, right? So someone thinks they need one, they want one, they ask for one and they get it. And if then a particular product can be owned by a CNA, the CVE numbering authority. So there are a bunch of numbering authorities within the CVE org organization. That means that they are responsible for a particular set of products. So if you ask for a CVE for those products, they will have an uh, opinion. But for most products in the world, I mean, we're talking, the world is big, right? There are many products. Most products actually don't have a CNA. And if you ask for a CVE for one of those products, there's, I mean, sure, no one is responsible for those. So the CVE organization or MITRE or any one of the other C CNAs, they will just give you a CVE if you ask for one. There's nothing preventing this from happening. So if you just think you need one, you will get one. And you don't have to provide evidence. You don't have to do know much. You can just insist that you need one. So basically it works like this. So if person P find, found, find a flaw, thinks there's a flaw, uh, invents a flaw with an AI, uh, they uh, register a CVE and they get one. And the one who actually made this product in this, my example, the imaginary product, why they get, they are not told, they have no idea, and there's no way to tell them about this. Um, so the CVE is handed out to some person somewhere who is not even, a give, you don't even have to tell anyone your name, you're doing it with an email, which could be, as you know, highly temporary or whatever, you just get a CVE. And then after some just a while you can just make that cve public without much requirement on anything really you can so person p here in he thinks he found a, he because it's always a he here um it found a problem in the product it might be completely wrong or right we don't know and they sub public uh, publish this cve suddenly one day and the ones making the product they have no idea that they did or uh, anything Yes, and this is how it works. It has always worked like this for for the de for decades, and it's a great system because suddenly one day someone it just internet blows up because someone has published a high uh, or a CV about your product. And okay, uh, why is this a concern for anyone? Yeah, sure. What is a CV really? It's just a bug ID, right? Who cares about a bug ID on the internet? Well, quite a lot of people do. So in the mean meantime, then, so. Someone then publishes that CVE. It's completely made up, maybe, or maybe not, who knows. Um, then there's this organization called NVD. It works sort of within this uh, galaxy, this uh, same atmosphere. They're called the National Vulnerability Database, uh, which is fun because it's a national database, which means it's made for the American government, but it doesn't matter because it's certainly not used nationally. It's used by everyone highly international but anyway um, they import all those cvs that appear i mean mitre ha manages the central database of all the cvs that appear they come in the volume of i think i think in 2024 i think the, the estimation is north of 40k cvs so that's sort of roughly the volume i think it's was around 30k last year so quite a lot of them but anyway nvd imports all of those 
and they uh, because they know everything they set cvss scores for all these issues um, so you know they get us uh, this uh, person p created a cve for a product the, the owners of that product have no idea they uh, now nvd gets a hand uh, they get notices they notice this new cve they set a score and what uh, how do we know what to set the score to uh, here's a issue with pretty much no details given at all by the person who found a potential problem so um what did they do okay so a, a little parenthesis here i'm talking a little bit about how nvd has typically worked up until very recently earlier this year when everything broke so now we don't know how this works because everything is shaking because the volume or and the system this works with has turned not really functional surprise uh, and uh, things are changing but anyway I, I'll, I'll pretend as if things hasn't crumbled and fallen apart but anyway so the, the cves get into nvd's database and they well, they want to set the score on this uh, on this new issue that they notice. And by the volume, I said 40k per year. What's that? That's a hundred more than a hundred issues per day on, on average. So, how do you set a, a, a critical? How do you set a score on a hundred issues per day? Uh, it's tricky. Okay, so there's this CVSS not nvss even though it says on the title here that's a typo cvss the the common vulnerability scoring system it's a way to set a score for an issue it's meant to be from 0 to 10 right 10 being the worst possible that you can get typically you don't ever get to 10 you get to 9.8 or 9.9 .9, but that's it doesn't matter that's bad enough and there are also different versions of the CVSS. There's, I think the, the, the regular one recently used is 3.1. There's a 4.0 in the works, but it doesn't matter. Calculation of this is highly subjective. You have to sort of, several of the questions is, is this easy, hard, or uh, normal to, to reach? Or there are several of these where you have to pick one of the three different levels. And, if, um, and it's certainly not an objective exercise. So depending on what you think, uh, you end up with different values. And you tend to, well, you have to know and think and, you know, put your finger in there. I think it's uh, semi-decently easy. Then you end up with a score. That's your CVSS score. But it doesn't include things like how is the product used exactly? Is it one user? Is it a billion users? I mean, is it? A, are you making this product? Is it a toaster? Is it a spaceship? Is it who's using it and, and in what kind of environments? It's certainly not easy here to just get this single one-dimensional number for a flaw. I mean, the whole concept is actually flawed from the beginning. So how can you set a single score for a flaw? It depends on how you use the product, right? It's not the product. To, if you make a library, for example, if you, it's, you can't really tell how bad it is un, unless you know exactly how the edit is used. So it, it's really, really hard. In the curl project, we have sort of abandoned uh, trying to set a score because the score often just becomes really hard, impossible to set, and it becomes such a difficult area to discuss and so we have just sort of gone back to we just used four different levels we just low medium high critical that's the only level we use and we then and then we tend to compare with previous issues and and weigh in different areas as we know um, about the code about the yeah well used little used and things like that i mean it's still hard how is this a low or medium is it high exactly how how dangerous is this flaw it's it's i mean yeah it's hard it's hard for everyone anyone okay so the nvd then sees that new cv hey look there's a new cv for product y it sounds really horrible because uh, as i mentioned when you create one of these cvs you don't have to provide a lot of data you basically don't have to provide data at all so you someone created the cve with barely anything 
but the, the little description you provide might sound horrible. And NVD then is supposed to set a score for this. Without knowing anything, the, the little hint they have from, from the CVE is, uh, it sounds horrible. Like, like a, a recent example, it said integer overflow. Pretty much, that was pretty much the only thing it said in a, in a curl CVE from a while back. Okay, so and we didn't see this. Okay, it says integer overflow. What's the worst possible outcome of an integer overflow in someone's code without knowing anything about the code? Because these guys, they have a hundred of these every day, right? They don't have time to actually investigate. So the worst case here for an integer overflow, yeah, that's pretty bad. So we don't have any time. We don't have any skill. We don't look at code. We just, poof, surely that's CVS 9.8, CVSS 9.8. Uh, I mean, surely, because why not? The worst possible outcome for this certainly has to be like this. So the world is probably close to on fire because there's an integer overflow in this project. And the project, by the way, still doesn't know about this, of course, because no one has told them because there's no way to do That's not built into the system. There's no, there's no way to give feedback to any product uh, producers or makers here. So yeah, that's, that's the way how it works, right? Um, but of course, NVD then in recent days, as I mentioned, they haven't really been able to keep up. I presume it has to do with the volume, but I don't know this. Um, so this is sort of falling apart there. <laughs> Just the other day, they even um, broke the certificate on the site. Anyway, so there are, I mean, sure. So so we can, so even though NVD in their um, their setup is not going to be able to continue this maybe or maybe they will get more funding and more people involved and they will continue this it, but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if they can do this or not because it's uh, hilariously broken anyway so it doesn't matter because they don't have the knowledge the skill the ability to do this <laughs> so anyway so there's an a, a ongoing cve volume explosion i there are other ways than than NVD that is that are coming. Other organizations are going to do the same thing or additional things, and they're called in the in the CVE world they they're called ADPs, authorized data publishers. So there are going to be other organizations like NVD that can then yeah change or add data to CVEs about their views about their, in the in the similar way that NVD has done it. So in our opinion, this CV has this score or other related things. I guess it's mostly the score, maybe other details as well. <clears throat> so there, there's certainly ongoing discussions and ongoing changes in how this is going, uh, how this is managed. But um, the main, the main point here is that they still don't know much about the product, the project that they are <laughs> asserting opinions and comments about, because how could they? So at the same time then, so the CVE was created, NVD is there, it was there and, and added that CVSS score. Suddenly it says 9.8 and that is now in a database on the internet. And who is using that database? Recently, over the last few years at least, there's cropped up a very popular category of products called vulnerability scanners, right? Okay, now some uh, people in the chat room are talking about the ACV from last year, the one I mentioned about the um, that integer overflow. The integer overflow that I'm talking about, I blogged about this CVE. Uh, the NVD scored it at 9.8, exactly as I said, from the beginning, because how would they know? They don't know anything. They just said it. Uh, so I argued with them and complained about them and whined to them. And then they could suddenly reevaluate the score. And so then it went from 9.8 to 3 point something in just a click -a click which I think just proves how stupid the setup is. Because how can a earth, the sky is falling problem suddenly become a Oh, what's this? We don't care about this problem. It's the same problem, nothing new, and they didn't really care about the code. So it's just... Okay, so uh, then we have this fun category of, of um, products, projects, called vulnerability scanners. They, 
they have the i mean back in the day they, they, i didn't have to care about the cv showing up with 9.8 because who cared uh, because we would have our list of cvs that we would be public a lot and tell our users about and then with yeah yeah someone says it's 9.8 it's not true we can just forget about it but now there's a new category called vulnerability scanners so they import all the cvs and all their metadata and they get metadata from nvd so they have a bunch of you know how, i don't know a lot of cv they know a lot about cvs and uh, scores and affected products and everything so they scan systems for known vulnerabilities hey they know that product y uh, with this version is vulnerable for this cve because it says so in the cve database and nvd has set a really high score for these cvs we better find them and tell the users about them and warn everyone about their use right so you run the scanner so this system contains product y version v then it must be vulnerable too um, maybe it is maybe it isn't first of all the, the cvs don't actually have the high granularity so they really can't tell exactly which products are vulnerable or not M mostly they just have a version range right this version on that to version that but it doesn't contain details as if it was built with this particular feature on off this particular dependency on off the blah 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 that is usually just in the free text in the cve or even not in the cve just in the in the security advisory published by the product that's not at all in the cve and nvd they didn't know about it this the cve database doesn't know about it and the vulnerability scanner certainly does not know about it either but it's still there it now warns the user hey hey this product is super dangerous because it has a CV, uh, cvss uh, 9.8 per, uh, vulnerability and what happens then okay it doesn't really know anything but it says that uh, this product is vulnerable the user getting this warning of course he doesn't know anything either because I mean, how is the user supposed to know? He uses a, his own system with lots of products and possibly vulnerability, vulnerable products. And a user, of course, I, I mean, it's like taking your car to the repair shop, right? The, the, the mechanic is telling you about something in your engine. Who are you to doubt that? I mean, that's the expert telling you this. Uh, I don't know. If it says so, you get a warning on the screen, that's scanned for it. It's a capable tool. It's, it tells me there's a warning here. Of course you trust it. I mean, you're, you're bound to. And a lot of users these days seem to then be mandated. And they have signed contracts. So we're obliged here to fix all our problems within a number of business days. Otherwise, we risk getting some kind of fines or pay some fees or something so hey you know do 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 on the screen you should fix your 9.8 issue within seven days okay how do i do that i have no idea but the scanner says i'm vulnerable to this so yeah i'm vulnerable so i better remove this or or replace it somehow right so it's if, if i run this scanner it says i'm vulnerable uh, i have my the clock is ticking here um my boss is on me i, I better fix this so when you find a vulnerable component, it says 9.8, the scanner is flashing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when that happens to be curl.exe, for example, running in Windows 10, and you get that big alert, you need to fix it. Yeah, it's tempting to just remove it. And users have, quite a lot of users have, right? And this is the sort of the, the look. Um, where is it up there uh, so um, yeah this is the the users who are then have removed curl from windows and in in this particular case of course maybe you're not familiar with it but uh, curl.exe is actually a part of windows itself right it's built by Win uh, microsoft and it's bundled in the operating system shipped and updated with windows update so if you remove components in windows components from your windows installation and then you try to do windows update again it'll tell you in in uh, clear terms that you have fiddled with it or manipulated the uh, operating system so it will just cease to work and refuse to do any further updates so basically backed into a corner and now you are in a bad position and then you look like this and Okay, there's really no way to stop this because at MITRE, if you try to, as I, as I have tried several times, 
Uh, I argue that, uh, hello, dear Mitre, you have accepted a CVE ID here that is actually for an issue that is not a security problem. And me knowing something about the code that I have worked with for 28 years, I, I think I'm in a position here to say something, you know, are you for my point? And I could sort of, you know, look at this code, blah, blah, blah. It's executed in this condition and it this this problem you're talking about, it only happens because blah, 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 and, and, and argue that, you know, it's not a security problem. Um, and what do I to do? I mean, they, of course, uh, know much more than I do. And uh, they, in their infinite wisdom, says, ah, it could be a security problem. You might be full of... Uh, so, no, we won't remove it. It'll be there. It could be a security problem. Because an anonymous person on the internet told them to, and they don't... Yeah. Yeah, and NVD then, they, they, since it's actually a CVE, NVD says, ah, the Amiter says it's CVE. We won't remove it because we can't remove it. It's, it's, it's a CVE. And if it's a CVE, it's our job to set a score for it. We, uh, and as I mentioned already now, I can, um, I can sort of compl I actually don't know the formal procedure for doing this, but I, I basically just email them and complain a lot and it has uh, several times they've actually re-evaluated the issues and done a new score so they actually lowered them and if they're low enough they become a less of a problem for me a nuisance because then they won't show up in the security scanners and then they won't the problems will not fall down on me anymore and then i can ignore them they're still considered a cve and a security problem to some people but i can sort of uh, forget about them and that's good enough for me but it's still it, it doesn't stop i mean i don't have any remedy here i can i cannot stop this issue from entering and this then of course makes the project owners like me and i'm certainly not unique here i'm not saying that curl is special or i am special because we know that this has happened a lot of others too and it keeps happening to a lot of other open source projects and projects in general so i just talk about this because i know about it it has happened to me but it happens to a lot of others as well and we have no way of stopping this so we just get upset and sad and uh, we get a hair loss and we drink too much and end users they, I mean, th this doesn't help anyone because the users of our products, they, uh, well, they don't care really much about bogus CVEs, but the users are running the security scanners. They are certainly just hurt because why would they get security alerts about uh, problems that are not security problems? Uh, so yeah, the, the ones who are selling security scanners, they are probably just happy because they can sort of earn money and I don't know. But warning about bogus CVs, who wants that? I don't, and no one actually wants that. So there's, there's no way for a normal product to stop this, except one way. There's only one way. To block this as, at the source, stop the bogus stuff from entering from the big, from the, you know, from the root or the top, wherever it enters uh, the middle row, <laughs> depending on how you want to see it. So the only way to stop it is to become a CNA, the certi uh, CVE numbering authority. Because if you're a CNA, then you can say, so I wait, hey, I'm a CNA, I'm responsible for these products. And then you name them pretty much. Hey, I'm responsible for all these products. And then if someone, that pro uh, person P comes, the next time person P comes and say, hey, I want to file a CVE against this product. And if, if there's a C existing CNA owning this product, then the CNA is asked, hey, is this a CVE worthy issue? And now I can say, nope. Yes, you can say integer overflow, but it wasn't an integer overflow in the security uh, risk uh, aspect. So it's not a problem. And then it's denied, rejected, go away. We block it at the source, then it works. But there's also an appeals process. So the person can actually still circumvent this but i think that is fine because you also don't want the cna to be able to block valid problems right so if it's actually it is a security problem i should not be able to just say no right anyway now we're at 400 i think we're at 400 and now we're approaching 410 cnas i think so the um, the amount of cnas is is i think we were 350 back in december so I think we will, might be uh, yeah, closing to 100 new per year. I think we're going to see this um, number increase 
further because uh, again everyone wants to protect their own backyard right we i certainly do and i'm uh, it's sad but this is the only way and it doesn't really scale i think I, it's a pretty low key or low, low friction way to i mean it's not that difficult to be saying hey you know it's not much of an overhead either so it can certainly the system can certainly handle a lot of cnas i'm sure but it's still it's it's uh, it's a flawed setup here yeah i mean we're talking about a world with what a million open source projects should we all be cnas or should we all sort of try to get some existing cna to include our products in their set of products so that they can block crap from entering mm, i don't know i think i think so far we have also not seen this uh, abused at scale yet so it hasn't i mean the the sky has not fallen in this um, setup and the system yet so i don't think i don't think we have been hurt enough here for anything to change dr drastically in this setup anyway this is how it works so yeah now curl is a cna because we want to stop the crap from entering into the system for any product that we work on so now we can actually say no we i, <laughs> I haven't had the chance yet the last bogus cna no, sorry the last bogus cve we got to curl actually arrived uh, while we were in the process of becoming a cna so <laughs> kind of interesting so even though we were in the process of becoming a CNA, all of a sudden one day another CVE popped up that were assigned to us or attributed to our product. Anyway, so we are CNA since uh, end of 2023, and uh, yeah, we can also control the severity better. I think it's the it's the idea. But as I mentioned, CVSS scores uh, it's uh, it's a mess, and um, we I try to avoid them. I, nowadays, I think we are going to be seen as a quote-unquote bad CNA soon because we don't set the CVSS scores on our CVEs, but we'll see about that. I don't mind being a bad CNA if that is what it means. <clears throat> if this is worth it or worth the effort and the administration and everything, I, I'm not sure, but we haven't really given it this. I mean, we ha it hasn't even been a year since we became a CNA. Uh, it hasn't been that much work yet. It's quite convenient to be able to generate your own CVEs and everything. So, I, so far it's been quite a, uh, an easy ride. So, but the scale, right? There are millions of open source projects. How how are we going to handle this? I there's been a lot of talk this year since um, since this, the Linux kernel became a CNA. Uh, just after we uh, the curl project became a CNA, and they have really upped their game in creating CVEs. So they have started. Um, they have been. Uh, they are a part and an explanation to these um, CVE growth this year. Uh, but uh, in, from my point of view, that's just a an early feel for how it's could look like right because i mean assuming we have a million projects and everyone and uh, let's say a fair share of them at least you know a percent of them have a security problem every year or so uh, that's a lot of cvs let's say we have 10 of them every year 100 in the bigger projects that's a large volume of cvs that we really haven't been seen before we haven't really set up a system that works for it and so i think we might need to consider that and in the linux kernel and curl for for some i i think this is kind of fun because i, I did the math just uh, a few weeks ago and, and i discovered that we actually have roughly the same amount of cves per lines of code in the curl project and the linux kernel project so um roughly one cve per thirteen thousand lines of code per year then so yep at the moment i guess that will change over time of course but recently i think that means that in the linux kernel that there are at i think 3k cvs per year rate and in curl we're at 11 something 
just shows how different in scale in the lines of code the two different projects are. But anyway, I'm not saying that these, this is a number that goes for projects in general. I'm just saying that um, I think we could see many more CVs in many more projects if we just would look harder and if they would just report better and if people would just, hmm, yeah. And how do we handle that? So people that are then talking about how, how, how you make open source robust. And I, of course, work hard on this myself. I, I want to work on making sure that the projects I work in will never appear in one of those lists about open source issues in the past or, you know, one of these. I don't want to make a heart bleed uh, event. But the real hard truth is that there are no silver bullets here. You just have to follow all the best practices. We're engineers, right? We know how to do software. We just also make need to make sure that we actually do those steps that we know that we have to do to do proper development secure stuff and then curl we of course we just make sure that we do that tighten all the bolts you know make everything a little bit better every well every, at every opportunity so we okay we start out with two uh, two fa of course required for maintainers we review all the changes or most of the changes we really make an effort to make readable code. We follow the code standard. We do more tests, more CI as we go along, the more we can. Um, and we add tools like fuzzers, analyzers, we have a bag bounty and we have um, had several audits of the code from third party companies. And then we make sure that we don't have any binary blobs to avoid the XZ way to do things. We have 100% reproducible builds. So anyone can actually verify that whatever we ship is exactly what is in there, what's promised, nothing extra. We have signed commits, we have signed releases as tarballs, and we have signed tags, and we fix, fix everything that is reported as a vulnerability as quickly as we possibly can, and transparently, of course. So, yeah. And quite frankly, very few proprietary products are even close when it comes to these best practices. And it's very hard for them to even be that uh, to that level because of the open source nature of everything that I talked about earlier. So that's sort of that was what I'm aiming for is then to make sure that whatever we ship is supposed to be a really solid building block for modern digital infrastructure just to allude to a certain XK CD. But, but, and of course, I, I really wanted to also mention AI because AI is of course very uh, hip to mention and talk about these days, but of course AI for security is not gonna save us short term and uh, it's not going to be anything that helps us this year, probably not next year either. And it really is a tool right now that helps uh, helps fool researchers think that they have found problems and it helps researchers to do really well phrased crap that takes a longer time to debunk because the crap now is very well put and very well, uh, very well expressed and um, very verbose actually and it becomes an added burden to maintainers such as myself and as has been mentioned it's a little bit of a potential denial of service in that regard that every security report to a open source project is at a very high priority right so it tends to it overrides everything else we do in the project so the more security reports we get the less other things we can do because it will always um, trump everything else pretty much so filing a lot of sec um, security reports to a project is a way to make sure that they can't do much else. So a very well phrased crap report takes a long time to debunk and it takes bandwidth and uh, time off from maintainers. I think I have an example and um, I mean Pretty much then researchers are using these AIs and ask for security reports. And uh, thankfully, some of them mention this is an older uh, issue to curl when they actually clearly <laughs> labeled the report that, hey, I asked the AI for a problem and it told me about it. So then we at least knew that they were using AI so that sort of we could be skeptic already from the beginning. And of course, it turned out to be completely wrong. but. 
in in other ways it'll just show up like this right and here it's here's an example of someone using an, an ai to generate a report in so it's very well phrased it's perfect english and uh, possibly it's too perfect because it's too friendly in a way that um, very few security researchers actually are but but um, as i sometimes um, uh, sometimes people are using these ais and translation services right so and, and help them to generate english so sometimes it's actually it could be that they just used a tool to make them phrase themselves better right so it's not there's a mix of ai and actual humans in here so it's not easy for me to just dismiss it oh clearly ai in and it doesn't have to be completely wrong just because it was made by an ai but in this case this is this is another issue from from the curl project in this case it was completely made up so it's yes the the ai was very convinced that it had found a problem it could not quite exactly explain how, but when I asked about it, it's um, and it moved its target a little bit. And of course, I, after a few back and forths, I realized that this is not going anywhere. It's completely fake, and I closed it. Still, took it takes time, takes an effort, and usually uh, a crap report is less well phrased. It's shorter, is easier to debunk, and takes less time. Anyway. That's um, that's it about where we are right now. So in the future, I'm pretty sure that we will see more CVEs. I think we're only seeing the beginning of an explosion of CVEs. So sure, the Linux kernel has uh, put a uh, load on the system that uh, the system was not uh, prepared for. But I think there's going to be, there's a there's a room for more projects and there's a room for more CVs to, to go this at this frequency and this level. So I think we're going to see more CVs. I think 2025 is going to be even more CVs than we had in 2024 and so on. So I think we're, we're starting to see a, well, the graph is um, moving upwards. And, and while there are a lot of problems with CVEs, as I mentioned, some of them, um, uh, there are no viable options really and there are some attempts to do alternatives but I, I don't think I don't see how the alternatives are fixing these problems or issues or concerns here because we need identifiers public identifiers to public problems and how do we manage this how do we set it's it's a challenging issue and I, I'm not saying that I, I have all the answers right I'm mostly just you know putting my fingers on some sore points and problems I don't I don't know the perfect solution to, to this and we certainly know that everyone now wants to be a CNA because everyone wants to stop put a stop to the to the ingress here we want to stop the crap from entering the system regarding our products it's fine if someone puts craps out to others products and CVSS of course remains problematic because it's too one-dimensional to set a single score for a single issue because it depends on so many different factors how are you using this how did you build it blah 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 so i i, I remain uh, uh, convinced that the solution has to be more dimensions possibly more scores i don't know people say oh well what about cvss 4.0 because it's due to that and and there are other ways to do scores and everything sure i i think the inherent problem is that Everyone, the, the ones who are actually looking at it, sort of the end users or the vulnerability scanners, they want a single score because a single score is easy to communicate, look at and, and talk about. But a single score will always be problematic because explaining a complicated issue in a single score is not possible. And in the EU, we have a CRA legislation, CRA legislation coming, which is going to be really interesting for uh, anyone making anything with software including open source and this conference that i talked about uh, that i did this presentation last week is was a lot about cra so i had to just throw in cra here there's a lot about i i think there's a lot of unknowns still around cra possibly it, it'll certainly make vendors creating things more aware and more um hopefully more aware when they ship what components they ship and the quality of the components they have in their digital stuff but yeah 
We'll see about that. It'll be an interesting time going forward, I'm sure, as it has been <laughs> in the past as well. And that's about what I wanted to say today. Um, so thank you for listening. If there are any questions in the chat room, yeah, that the CRA is the Cyber Resiliency Act. It's a they, they tend to say it as the CE branding for software. So you have to all the components in your stuff needs to be CE branded. So all your dependencies in your software stack needs to be CE branded. You need to know what you ship and you need to have S bombs and you need to be able to and so on and on. I'm not going to talk about it now. I don't know all that much about it, but uh, it is coming as a EU legislation and I'm sure it's going to affect a lot of software in general. It's harder to take questions in the chat room, so it's easier with an audience when people are sitting around hanging out the mic. Uh, someone disguises a uh, question as a monologue or and stuff like that. Uh, it's harder to do that monologue thing in a chat room. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> thank you for attending. Thank you for uh, watching. Uh, I will show up in another video somewhere. Uh, at a later time. I'll uh, end the recording now. Bye.